I'm really excited. Today I'm about to meet John Green, author of The Fault in Our Stars and some of the greatest books that are out there, and also nerd fighter extraordinaire. Do I have my nerd fighter voice on? Uh, you know, I first watched your video blog with your brother Hank, and I had, you know, watched some of this, and they said, now read this book. And I, I read this book, the, the Fault in Our Stars, and I'm, I was not expecting what, what I found because of this video blog. Uh, but, but the first thing I thought of is, are you really a 16-year-old girl? So I'm, I'm glad we met because I wasn't <laughs> quite sure. Uh, how do you do that? Well, I mean, in this case, I was writing a very specific character. I mean, I was writing from the perspective of this one girl. I think if I'd been trying to write a 16-year-old girl, I would have been in big trouble because I had nothing, no idea what 16-year-old girls were like when I was 16, and I don't have much of an idea now. But um, I felt very close to Hazel, and I felt very, uh, it was very easy for me to empathize with her, and that made it really kind of, it just made her, her voice came quite easily to me. John, you're famous for not revealing the plots of your book, and yet we have very little time, so what I'd like for you to do is please give us a quick elevator speech about the plot of your new book, The Fault in Our Stars. My new book, The Fault in Our Stars, is about two kids who meet at a support group for uh, kids with cancer. I really hope that you like it. Uh, that makes it sound really sad, but it's not really sad. It's really funny and, you know, hopeful. I mean, that's, it's always a little bit, I'm not doing a good job with an elevator speech. It's always a little bit uh, presumptuous when, when an author is like, my work is so funny, but seriously it is. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for reading. And as we say in my own town, don't forget to be awesome. Um, it, it's, and, and you, you traveled around to, to learn different locations and, and so you're really into both the character and, and the location and there's this authenticity. Yeah, well most of the book is set in Indianapolis where I live, um, which is an advantage. So I was able to go to those places pretty easily. But I also spent two months living with my family in Amsterdam. I've been to Amsterdam many times over the years, but um, I spent two months there thanks to the Dutch Literature Foundation and that was hugely helpful. Um, obviously Hazel and Augusta see Amsterdam as uh, tourists, but it was really helpful for me to be there for a longer time and to be able to um, see a little bit more of Dutch culture. But the headline is that John Green sees Indianapolis as the, the place to be. I do. I mean, I, I love Indianapolis. I, I'm a huge defender of, of Indianapolis against all of its, you know, the, there are so many people who think that, you know, Indianapolis is this nothing city, but we're the 11th largest city in America. Um, we have, you know, we have the greatest spectacle in racing. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot to recommend in Indianapolis. And I really wanted to set the book there because it's such a dramatic contrast with a place like Amsterdam. You know, the vast majority of us, I mean, I grew up in the suburbs and all suburbs in America sort of look the same and they have this sterility about them. And when you imagine a place like Amsterdam or Paris or wherever it is that, that captures your imagination, you romanticize it and you think of all of this history and all, everything that your place doesn't have. Um, but of course, the, the truth is that there's always something to recommend home as well. Well, I want to ask you a, another question about uh, this, this whole nerd fighter concept, because in addition to author, you're the lord of these nerd fighters, <laughs> and you're combating world suck. What, what is that, and how did this start? Well, in 2007, my brother and I started making videos back and forth with each other, and we're very nerdy, um, obviously, and our videos were, were, were nerdy. They were... Um, nerdy and they celebrated intellectualism and our fans started calling themselves nerd fighters because they fight for nerds and for nerd culture and um, over the years the project has really transformed into a mix of you know hu funny videos educational videos and um, community-wide projects to try to w do what we call decreasing world suck um, which can take the form of uh, raising money for a charity or um, you know, building pond sand filters in Bangladesh or Haiti in order for people to have uh, clean water in villages that haven't had clean water in decades. So it takes a lot of different forms. And it, and it really took off. I mean, there's over half a million uh, nerd fighters, I think. And, yeah. And, uh, I just joined Twitter finally a, a, a few weeks ago, and I, I have a few thousand t Twitter followers. I'm looking in to check out John Green. It's like over a million people. Yeah. And so you've really taken advantage of social networking to kind of reach all of your audiences. How, how has that been? How, did you start that from the beginning with a plan, or did it just kind of morph? Oh, was no, there was no plan. I just liked Twitter. Um, I mean, I don't use social networking sites that I don't like. So there's no secret marketing initiative or anything. <laughs> um, in fact, my publisher is always mad at me for not using Facebook very effectively, but I just don't like Facebook very much. Um, 
Sorry, Mark Zuckerberg, if you're watching this. Um, but I, 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 I like Twitter. I like the interactivity of it. I, I like that everybody is sort of on a, on a level playing field on Twitter. And I really also um, like Tumblr. And we love YouTube because YouTube is just such a great way to organize community-based projects. Um, and so it really was born of a desire to use the internet to connect with people um, and to talk about stuff that interests me with people I find interesting. Well, tell me about this, because this is another question that, I, that, that came in from, live from our studio audience. What's this breaking news? I'm told we don't have a studio audience. We don't have a studio audience. Which is, you like licking cats? No, I don't. <laughs> I, no, that was a punishment. Um, so yeah, one time I did something wrong. Like whenever we, we don't upload a video on time or whatever, the audience gets to punish us. And uh, one of my punishments was that I had to lick a cat. But the, I mean, the difficult part of it was not so much the licking of the cat, it was the finding of a cat that was like clean enough to lick. Uh, <laughs> because I don't, I'm not a cat owner myself. Um, so I had to call a bunch of friends and I just moved to Indianapolis at the time. I didn't really know anyone. So I had to, I had to really call in some favors to try to track down a, a lickable cat. You didn't knock on doors randomly. No, no, no. I wanted to make sure it was someone who I could trust that had recently bathed their cat. <laughs> <laughs> really, really good. So, uh, I think for posterity, we're going to have to ask you to, to lick this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, th thank you very much. It's it's a it's a great book. It's not what I expected having watched the video blog, but it it certainly is uh, dramatic and, and and pulls you through, and and it's getting rave reviews and obviously doing very, very well um, at the top of the chart. So thanks, yeah. thanks so much for taking the time and talking to us about it. Thank you, Skip. I appreciate it.